Hey, good morning, Witness Wednesday friends. It's a beautiful, beautiful cotton candy day. Over the last couple of hours, it's actually gotten colder uh, than when I first started looking for how to dress for the weather. And it is really the most wonderful time of the year. <laughs> Not only is it the celebration of the birth of Jesus, our Savior and our Lord, if we let him be our Lord and Savior, <sighs> But actually, today is the day after the longest night of the year. So I'm happy that we're moving toward more sunlight. We need that. Um, today, I want to bring some freedom to you. I was reading in Luke, uh, especially Luke 1, about John the Baptist. And his dad, Zachariah, who was an old man, and his wife, Elizabeth, was also older and uh, Zechariah was doing his uh, temple duties, tabernacle duties, synagogue duties, and he was in the Holy of Holies when an angel suddenly appeared to him and said, you are going to have a son that you've been praying for. Now he might have long forgotten that prayer because he was older, but he had prayed for a son. And his wife had never uh, had a baby, so she was barren and in that culture that was definitely negative so Zechariah completely forgot about Abraham and Sarah in that moment and he said you know how can I know this is true and the angel said I am Gabriel who stands beside God and I have come to give you this message and you shall name this child John and gave him more prophetic words about who John was to be and said that John, who we would later know as John the Baptist, would actually carry the mantle and anointing of Elisha and would turn the hearts of the fathers back to the sons and the hearts of the sons back to the fathers. And because of his unbelief, the angel had struck him uh, mute I guess he couldn't speak for a while, but he went home to his wife after his priestly duties were done. And yes, she conceived a child. While she was pregnant, you know, also what was happening in the world at that time was that the angel appeared to Mary and told Mary that you're going to have a son. You found great favor. And you're going to have a son. You're gonna, it's going to be conceived of the Holy Spirit. And his name will be Jesus, and he will be God with us. And Mary and Elizabeth were re related. They were cousins, I believe. And at a certain point, Mary traveled to see Elizabeth. And when she had traveled to see Elizabeth, Elizabeth's baby in, in her womb was about six months long. And that baby leapt and danced in her womb at the presence of Jesus in Mary's womb. It's just so exciting that the first person to identify Jesus was actually an unborn baby. And you know, there's a lot of turmoil um, and wrong being done and different opinions for different reasons about abortion. And this, this is not about abortion, but I just want to remind you that the Word of God says that the first person to recognize Jesus, who had come to earth as a, a man, as a three-month-long baby, was identified by a six-month-long baby. Um, and the angel had told Zechariah that John the Baptist would be filled with the Holy Spirit from birth. Now, there's no junior Holy Spirit. <laughs> and... Now that Jesus has fulfilled his earthly assignment, the Holy Spirit is available to all of us, even young children. So I want to encourage you to begin talking to your children and your grandchildren about Jesus and the Holy Spirit and having them you know, seek to be filled with the Holy Spirit. But let's talk about the birth of the baby John. Elizabeth's time had come and the folks were with her and celebrating this baby that was a promise of God. And now uh, she, 
Elizabeth literally had a different stature in the community because not only was she a mother, she was a mother of a son, which was so important. And they asked her, what will you name the child? And she said, his name will be John. They said, oh, no, 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 no. There's no one in the family named John. You can't name him John. So why was that important? Because in certain cultures, you only name your children names that have already been used in your family. So they expected her to name the baby Zechariah after her husband. And I know the Greek culture does that as well. The Greeks won't name their children except a name that's already been used in their family line. And that's what we call traditions of men. Now, they'd ask Elizabeth, she said the child's name is John. But they turned to Zechariah now, you know, for second opinion. And John asked for a tablet, Zechariah asked for a tablet, and he wrote the child's name is John. And the moment he did that, his mouth was opened, and he was able to speak. And he started to prophesy over his son. He started to speak the things that were stored up in his heart over these nine months of this promise that God was delivering and he prophesied in Luke 1 that he would have the anointing of Elisha and that he, John himself, <laughs> would turn the hearts of the, the fathers toward the sons and the sons toward the fathers. And that he would bring a new way for sins to be forgiven. So what God was doing here was literally breaking the traditions of men. And I want to just release that to you because some of you may be in bondage to traditions of men, especially this holiday season. Another tradition uh, that came along with the birth of John, who was to point the way to Jesus, was Jesus. He came to break the traditions of men. Jesus said, you set aside the laws of God for the traditions of men. So the most important thing about traditions and I'm not saying they're all wrong. There's some good traditions. But when we replace the law and the counsel of God with what we want, what we have always done, and what we think is better, you cast aside the law of God. And that law is love. We cast aside the love of God for the things that we want to do because we want to do it. So I want to encourage you, first of all, to apply this word to your relationship between you and God. So I'm talking about vertically. Ask the Lord. Seek the Lord. Read the word. I mean, it's written. God doesn't have many rules. I mean, he's got 10 rules, right? He doesn't have 30 or 50 or 100. Um, and everything else that we live should come out of those top 10 things that God says do and don't do. But we tend to do what our family has done all these years. We do the same thing that our mother or father did with that situation uh, because that was what was learned. So I just want to challenge you, take a look at what you do. Now we're talking about horizontally. Horizontally, what do you do in your relationships? Do you implement the law and the love of God in that relationship? Or do you have the traditions of men? And again, not all traditions are bad. But the ones that are controlling are bad. We have a phrase in the South, and I've talked to other friends from different parts of the United States, and we say, blood is thicker than water. And in my own life, that was used to control me. Uh, the full meaning and the complete phrase is the blood of battle, of a shared battle, is thicker than the water of the womb, which actually means you can have a deeper relationship with someone who shared the same battle with you and who have bled together with you than uh, someone who was born of the same womb. But unfortunately, like I said, you know, blood is thicker than water was used to say, prefer us over other people, no matter what kind of environment we've created for you. But that's not the truth. The blood of a shared battle is stronger than the water of the womb. Some of those traditions of men have caused us to carry decisions our whole life that really weren't our decisions. We've lived the decisions of other people. 
And we need to stop doing that. We need to walk according to the love and law of God. And the law of God is love God, you know, with your whole heart, mind, soul, body even, and love your neighbor as yourself. That is the full law of God. Now, there are some do's and don'ts that help us have a regulated and safe society, and those are, you know, the Ten Commandments. But love God first. And when you really do that, then you can love people. So this week is a very unique week in terms of uh, holidays, Christmas holidays, where we have a COVID kind of restriction. So we could make the excuse for something that we really don't want to do by saying, oh, it's because of COVID. But I challenge you, you know, there are some traditions in your family that need to be broken because they are controlling and they are not life-giving. So remember that John came to break tradition and to turn us back to the love of God. So this week when you're thinking of, you know, I, I go there and this is how I'm treated. I'm given the silent treatment um, in this group of people. You know, really, I've learned recently that's actually abuse and it's control. Now, um, I grew up in an environment like that, so for me it was normal. I've had other close recent relationships where the silent treatment was normal, and I didn't really know that it was abusive. I did know how it broke trust, and I know how the silent treatment makes me feel. It is not life-giving. It is actually death to the relationship. Uh, but I hadn't labeled it as abuse until I got more um, information and wisdom on that. But this week, how about this? Don't just say, well, it's because of COVID we won't be coming over. Say this, you know what? There's something really on my heart that I want to talk to you about for a couple of minutes. And can we do that tomorrow sometime, maybe at 2 o'clock in the afternoon? So call that person and say, hey, yeah, I just wanted to share with you that I don't feel comfortable coming over because I feel uncomfortable whenever the other guests in the room don't acknowledge me when they walk in, right? Um, that's probably happened to you. Or, you know, I don't feel comfortable when so-and-so comes in and just takes over. <laughs> you know, whatever your own personal boundaries are, decide how you want to be treated and then set up those boundaries for that. Or you could say, you know, I know that it really is important to you that the whole family is together and I'm going to do that just for you for two hours and then we will be leaving. So don't make it an all-day event to be in a toxic environment where you're being ignored, you're being given a silent treatment, where you're not respected and honored, where people don't acknowledge your accomplishments, or where you yourself are being ugly, right? Sometimes when we go into environments, it pulls out the worst in us. So I just encourage you that you've been released from uh, traditions of men. Walk with the love of God. Do everything in love. You know, pray first, and then when you're actually in that conversation, breathe before you speak and ask the Lord, what's your perspective on this? What do I say? What do I not say? But I want to just leave you with this. Jesus came to break those traditions of men. There had to be blood sacrifice for covering of sin, and the Pharisees were very, very good at that. Um, Sadducees, Pharisees, the leaders of the Jewish community, well, keeping the people in line. There's nothing wrong with structure and order. But if it's done from a heart of control, no one's happy. And there's no real life in it. There's no real love in it. But if the traditions of men are life-giving, like we always have a pajama party and hot chocolate on Christmas Eve, and we all love being here together and enjoying each other, and we look forward to that every year, that's a wonderful tradition. And it does not come between you and your relationship with God. Or, you know, every week we have date night on Friday night. That's a great tradition. And it doesn't separate you out from God's love. It actually allows uh, an environment for God's love to come there in the midst of you. So I'm not saying all traditions are bad. <clears throat> but I know myself, and I know you have too, you're aware of traditions that put you in situations where they're not loving and they're not kind. And they don't lift up Jesus so that all men can be drawn to him. So I'm giving you the freedom to say no thank you. 
I really can't do that this year, but thank you for asking, right? And then for those people who are important to your life, you know, don't just make excuses about why you can't do that. Just go ahead and say, hey, you know, there's something on my heart I want to talk to you about, and can I have a couple of minutes tomorrow around 2 o'clock to talk to you about it? And be prepared that if, uh, you know, everybody in that conversation isn't uh, trained on the inter you know, interpersonal skills, independent living skills of having a conversation like that, that you have to give some grace, maybe some subtle teaching leading from behind, and then always pray first. Pray first. Say, Lord, you know, may our conversation we have together be pleasing in your sight, and then give us wisdom how to handle this, and give us grace to receive it, receive it in love, right? But Whatever your traditions are in terms of what's on your table or what kind of tree you have or don't have, those things won't separate you from the love of God. Let's remember that our traditions should bring us together and everyone should have joy there. Now, you know, everybody's going through different things and there are different levels of joy. I just talked with a lady yesterday who lost her husband in April. She's going through those holidays right now for the first time without him. Now, she's probably not going to bring joy to any gathering per se, but I'm talking about in your everyday circumstances, surround yourself with those who love you and go into that room wherever you go that maybe someone doesn't love you and release your love to that room. You be love. You bring love. Guys, have a very happy Christmas. I celebrate Jesus who changed my life. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow and because I became a Christian when I was 10 years old, it literally changed my life. You guys have a great day. Bye-bye.